we're seeing media more accurately representing the science on climate change. You know, climate change is happening. It's caused by humans. Now we're seeing in terms of climate action that climate skeptics, deniers, or discourses of delay, they're giving those people in the news article more space, more power right. than like a relevant climate expert or policymaker. They're getting the science right. But then when they're talking about the actual solution and mm. action moving forward, we're still seeing this problematic balance issue uh, where one side is being favored. Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a lecturer, a climate corruption reporter and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic and political crises that we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. This is a critical time for our planet. It demands critical thinking. Click the subscribe button now and go to planetcritical.com to learn more. My guest this week is Lucy McAllister. Lucy is an assistant professor in environmental studies at Denison University in the United States. She joins me to discuss this huge piece of research that her and colleagues from universities all over the world did on how the media reports on climate. This is following on from a 2004 study done by Boykoff and Boykoff, which found that the media was misrepresenting the scientific consensus that climate change is a man-made problem, it is anthropogenic, by two-sidesing the problem, i.e. by giving balance in an article and giving space to climate deniers, essentially. So a couple of years ago, they decided to update this research and see if it was going better than it was uh, back then. And happily, over 90% of articles in the print media in five Anglophone countries around the world are now accurately representing the scientific consensus, which is great news. And Lucy walks us through that study. She also details how the tactics have become more sophisticated, that column inches are now being given to discourses of delay. Because it's quite difficult to outright deny climate change now, but it's very easy to say that we can't fix the problem or that it's too expensive. Lucy and I also discussed different ways of framing narratives, of solutions journalism, positive framing, and the studies that are being done around the world to look at how best to communicate to communities, how best to platform what communities are doing, and how to get the needle moving on citizens taking action around the world. I hope you all enjoy the episode. If you do, please share it far and wide. If you're loving the show, support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com or on Patreon. The link is in the description box below. By signing up, you'll also get access to the weekly article I write inspired by each interview. Thank you to everyone who has signed up and is supporting the project. I'm a vehement believer in ad-free and open access content, so Planet Critical wouldn't exist without the direct support of the amazing community. Thank you so much to all of you who keep the project going every week. Where are you right now? Are you in Colorado? Uh, no, I'm in uh, Granville, Ohio. So that's where see. Denison University is. Denison is doing some really cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very cool. It's sort of, um, it's interesting because it's mainly um, a teaching institution, like primarily mm -hmm. liberal, very strong focus on teaching. But the faculty, I mean, they're also definitely big research expectations, but the faculty are doing some really cool work there and um, really interdisciplinary cool. work. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I interviewed Fidel Kaboob um, just yeah. before yeah. he left um, okay. on all of his work around the Global South and MMT and e economics and stuff. And like, oh, cool. I have to yeah, say, they have a very strong econ department. Yeah. Like, I have to say, on very, the, most of the papers I'm interested in reading, and when I say reading, obviously I mean <laughs> reading the abstract. Like, let's all, let's all be honest here. I see the name Denison coming up really, really, really often. It's just in terms of climate stuff, like the faculty is yeah. doing really amazing yeah. work. Yeah, there's some amazing, like Sarah Sup in um, data analytics. She's also an ecologist and she does some amazing work. There's just, yeah, it's, it's really cool to be there. <laughs> Good. I get your monthly uh, climate change report, which I'm sure that we will go into the media oh, right, and climate yeah, change. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So so let, let's kick off. First of all, obviously, thank you so much for, for coming on Planet Critical and making the time. I'm really thrilled to have you on to discuss your work. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it on behalf of all my co-authors, colleagues. <laughs> I tried to do my best to represent our work. <laughs> I'm sure you do a great job. Can we talk about the original Boykoff and Boykoff study in 2004 on balance as, as bias and use that to then obviously set the foundation to then go into the work that you've been, you and your colleagues have been doing? 
Yes, absolutely. So that's a great place to start. So um, Boykov 2004 was sort of the first paper to identify this in the print media where what they were finding was that, you know, there's this normal standard within the media, which is great to balance coverage and give both sides of the stories equal weight. But when you do that with climate change, it becomes very problematic um, because that's you can't be giving equal credence to both the relevant climate experts and climate change deniers because mm -hmm. that's uh, misrepresenting the scientific consensus on climate change, which is overwhelmingly 97 percent of relevant climate experts agree that climate change is um, anthropogenic uh, cause, man-made mm -hmm. mm -hmm. or human climate change. Um, so that is deeply misleading for the public when you're giving equal credence to both sides. Um, and so our study was, this was, the, the data collection for that ended in 2002. Um, but today, I mean, it's a widely um, cited article and really important. It was featured in um, Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth, um, very effectively. And I think that really... Um, galvanized a lot of change. I mean, I think it was part of a lot has changed in the media landscape, but I think that that research um, played a part in it for sure. And, um, and so people were still to this day citing that original study about the media uh, sort of misaccurately representing scientific consensus on climate change. So mm. we were like, oh, that's changed. <laughs> and updated analysis was critically needed. And we also expanded it to widely to five countries um, uh, so that it could be, you know, more representative of global media. Um, and uh, what we found is good news. <laughs> Uh, right, that, that now over 90% of the print media of the articles we examined across the five countries accurately represented the scientific consensus on climate change. There was variations in um, across time and in certain outlets, but on average, overall, the media are getting it right most of the time, which is great. Um, there were <laughs> some important exceptions, um, like conservative, um, historically conservative media outlets, um, like, I want to get the names right. There's Canada's National Post um, and uh, Australia's Daily Telegraph and Sunday Telegraph and the UK's Daily Mail and Mail on Sunday. Those all had um, significantly less accurate coverage of climate change, but still more than 50%. Um, so, but not... Like, <laughs> That's a low bar. I think it was bar. around... <laughs> 70 percent yeah no no student wants that <laughs> oh my yeah, god yeah and it, the, the difference was sign statistically significant compared mm -hmm. to like you know the guardian which is doing uh, phenomenal and mm -hmm. it was really interesting the people who reached out to us after this study you know two key papers one was the guardian they were i think i don't know where they are 97 percent accuracy or something mm -hmm. um this was over a significant period of time, but they wanted to know, uh, like their head science writer, what were the articles where they where it was not accurate, and they wanted to go back and fix that and address it. So that was pretty fantastic. And then, interestingly, on the other side of the spectrum, another paper who I won't name <laughs> also reached out <laughs> for different research, wanting to examine the data and which we shared with them. Um, so it was just, it was a very interesting experience as well after we published the paper. <laughs> So, so tell me then, um, so you found that, right, so 90% of print media um, in, or 90% of articles in print media in these five Anglophone countries, if I remember correctly. Yes, yes. Um, so that's a limitation, only English speaking countries. Okay. Yeah. They were yeah. accurately representing the scientific consensus um, that Correct. climate change is a man-made problem. Um, exactly. And exactly. So tell me what... I suppose, how, how do you study something like that? And perhaps using that 3% of the Guardian's pieces to, to get into it, like how they sort of misrepresented it uh, a couple, well, a handful of times or whatever that 3% represents. Yeah, like a few articles, nothing. A few yeah. articles, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it was a really, um, I would say, rigorous uh, process uh, to come up with the systematic review. Um, we had a pretty big research team team because we were going through thousands of articles. Mm. Um, so first we, we pulled, you know, all the articles uh, over the period of study. Uh, we took a random sample of that, more uh, randomization to get, you know, so that's more representative. Um, and then we, we worked on um, 
we had an existing code book that we iterated on from the original Boykoff and Boykoff article. Sorry, um, can you explain a code book as well? Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> so this is a, um, I can even pull up some, uh, it was also in the paper. Um, so a code book is basically, um, we had a series of, I'm trying to see how I should break this down. So basically, <laughs> it, the idea is um, uh, we were reading these articles um, for like, was that was the article accurately representing scientific consensus on climate change? We would define that in the code book. That would be like mm -hmm. code, I believe it was two. Or was it talking about um, natural variation of climate change? So saying that climate change is happening, but it's only due to natural variation. Mm -hmm. Or, um, you know, outright denial. I think mm -hmm. that was like code number four. <laughs> this is like, this is code no, red. <laughs> climate change is not happening. Yeah. Um, and, um, uh, and so, and then, you know, there's another code for something that's not relevant. So we had a series of codes and basically we did those, wrote those out in great detail, gave examples of each one. So the, and the idea is, you know, that anyone could take this code book, go to a same set of articles and do the same process to get the same, you know, outcome. Mm -hmm. So we also did this intercoder reliability where we all, we all had the same code book, but they're different interpretations mm -hmm. of codes, um, which is natural. <laughs> you know, we all had a, a you know, expertise in climate change and science, climate science. Um, but we wanted to make this, you know, <laughs> obviously, you know, so that anyone could do, do the mm. same process. We, we checked that we were all um, making the same coding decisions, you know, mm -hmm. um, enough of the time, right, according mm -hmm. to social science standards. So we did all those calculations with a pilot set. Uh, we definitely met that threshold. Um, and then we went off and would code hundreds of articles on our own. And then we would come back together. We would discuss them. And every article where we had a disagreement, uh, or I might have coded as a two, someone else coded it as a three, then we would talk about it and say, well, mm. why did you do this? And we would sort of um, discuss that even further, further iterate, revise the code book. So that ev and everyone um, did this. So we had so many meetings. So it took many years <laughs> to get through all this data. And... Um, yeah, and that's how you that that was like the process that we went through. Um, so yeah, very comprehensive. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think it's just yeah. very interesting for for anybody that um, isn't in the sciences or in, hey, anybody that doesn't know what a code book is. <laughs> like myself, it is very yeah. important to understand how it is exactly that you sort of come to these decisions um, or the, these conclusions. Rather, that's the correct absolutely. word. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. So then in sort of the uh, publications that were typically representing it accurately, in those odd examples where they were misrepresenting, how, how does that come about exactly? I mean, it could be for a variety of reasons. I mean, one, you know, right now, a lot of newspapers are having to cut their science teams. Mm. There's a lot fewer resources. Um, there's a lot of pressure on journalists uh, for all sorts of reasons, um, you know, to produce those splashy headlines, those novel pieces um, focused around these events. Um, so I think that definitely played into it, just a general lack of expertise of not um, resources and also journalists is not having necessarily the training or the time yeah. to, um, uh, I mean, climate science is, is complicated. Totally. <laughs> you know, it's, they're, they're, you know it, there's a lot of parts of it that are very difficult to understand. And that's what yeah. makes it such a weird problem. It is so difficult to communicate to the public yeah. in, a, in an accurate way. And so I think that you know, that's also extremely difficult for the journalists. Some journalists, you know, they have less resources, less time cause to really dig into this and to clearly explain it. Um, so I think that that's part of it. Um, other parts of it, I think the ideological slant of the paper played mm -hmm. into it. Mm -hmm. um, the different discourses that are uh, being represented in those papers, um, or the way things are framed or where, you know, importance is uh what's being prioritized yeah. um because even though you know, there's been a lot of interesting work like even though now we're seeing the um media more accurately representing the science on climate change you know climate change is happening it's cues are caused by humans um we're still seeing now i mean uh rachel what's out of brown is doing some interesting work where now we're seeing in terms of climate action that climate skeptics deniers or discourses of delay they're giving those people in the news article or in the um, 
in the text more space, more power, right. like than people than like a relevant climate expert or policymaker or people working on this. Um, so even that weighting of uh, they're acknowledging, you know, climate change is happening. Uh, they're acknowledging the role of humans and the significant role of humans in causing this issue. So they're getting the science right. But then when they're talking about the actual solution and action mm. moving forward, we're still seeing this 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 problematic um balance issue and uh, uh, where one side is being favored much more significantly than the other. So now we're seeing much more, it's shifted, it's, uh, it's uh, to it's much more, more subtle forces. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Sort of the doom aspect or, you know, there's nothing we can do to address this now or it's going to be too costly. There's a whole uh, excellent framework outlined by, like, uh, I don't know if you know Lamb at all, um, it's uh, him and a bunch of colleagues. I can send you a list of some of these. I think you'd oh, find yeah, really please. interesting. But they've outlined uh, a great framework for how all these different uh, discourses of delays are sort of what they look like, what they are, and how they're embedding themselves. And an important limitation of our study was we were looking at the print news media, uh, which is still very significant, but we don't know about other forms of social media or television, you know, is it still, I don't know, is it being accurately represented there? I'm not so sure. <laughs> mm. Bill Nye, the science guy, is always up on the, like, John Oliver had this great bit about, like, it's always Bill Nye, the science guy, climate expert, and then climate denier on a video screen. Um, and there hasn't been a systematic study to look at that yet. Is that, you know, you know how much of the time is that happening? So mm. while it's getting better in the print media, we don't know. More research needs to be done on other types of media, how the science is being represented. Because this is just a, this is just a first step, right? Of, yeah. Of, um, yeah. So that, that was an important limitation of our work, but always more work to be done. <laughs> yeah, always. But that is so interesting, isn't it? How like the, the tactics have now changed because it's very, it's very difficult to deny, you know, climate Absolutely. change is man-made unless you're Absolutely. just in a hole on the internet somewhere. But for now, yeah. to just give more column inches to somebody says, this is actually going to be too expensive and the economy can't handle it. Exactly. It's just another yeah. way of denying drops, the drops, changes. Drops. Yeah, 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 exactly. that need to be made. Yeah. God. And it is an absolutely interesting that it's an Anglophobe um, or Western phenomena. Like primarily, right. an, that was one of the reasons why we selected English-speaking uh, news sources, because this is primarily an issue in these countries that we studied. Right. Um, this is not this, this type of denial or debate um this is not happening in the global south <laughs> like really um, you know other I, I um in other parts of the world there's not so much um debate about this it's much more focused on the problem addressing it what are the solutions and all sorts of the, there's a lot less debate um, you know, and, and it makes sense intuitively, the places that are the least responsible and facing the absolute worst impacts now mm -hmm, mm -hmm. have been, are, are, they're, they're feeling it, you know, and, and much, and now we're starting to feel it too. I mean, it's undeniable everywhere, but, mm -hmm. uh, um, so, I mean, it makes sense that they, they were there way ahead <laughs> yeah. of us, you know, and enter in, you know, in the global South and, and sort of thinking about this, I think. How interesting. So, do you know that if they have, and I, actually, I don't know this, if they have a different uh, tradition of media? It's a great question. Mm. <laughs> it's a very interesting. I, uh, I, I'm not the person to talk to. About mm. that. I mean, it's, it is interesting. There's, um, uh, there's, this is uh, an important point, though, because there's been a lot less research on media in the Global South. Mm -hmm. um, it's severely understudied in the literature um, about media and climate change communication. You see a lot of uh, studies of like specific countries, which are fantastic to really go in depth, like in India, for example. Um, uh, and you see some cross-national comparisons of a developing country quotes developing country um, with a more developed country like the UK and China or the US and India sort of these these types of comparisons um, but work I'm working on right now is it just uh, has an exclusive focus on media and the and the global south and what they're saying um, and there's lots of reasons for this and it has been improving over time again I can send you another study that you know demonstrates this um, it has been getting better 
but there's definitely a lack of research in this area. So, um, and also of researchers from these places, it's, you know, it's been, you know, the West, the U S the UK, most yeah. of the work has been, uh, like out of these places, more resources. Um, and it's been about these Western countries. Um, mm. yeah. So that's problematic. <laughs> it is problematic. But then again, it is also the, the narratives in these countries which need to change if we're going to make Absolute. the changes necessary in order to tackle it. Yeah. And these are the ones most historically responsible for causing yes. the problem. Yes. So they should absolutely be the, There's absolutely important focus to investigate. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So this, so this global side question then of the fact that what we're seeing Le less or very little of this balance as bias phenomenon of just tackling climate change. I as... can't say. I can't say. But, but, I don't you, know. but you, but you I said, know. you said, you said it's not as much of a problem there. That was kind right, of what we see right. thus far. I did. Yeah. So of the existing literature, what you're seeing is you're not seeing um, as much of this polarization, uh, uh, like you know, in the U.S., the Democrats versus the Republicans. Right. Um, it's it's different in these countries. Um, but Is it still more work needs to be. Uh, no, no, I'm not saying that either. <laughs> right. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No worries. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I want to be careful because I, I feel sure. like I need uh, more work needs to be done in that area. But like of the current existing studies, like what they're talking about, it's more, it's, it's more solutions focused. It's, it's, um, um, and I can, I, I have a, um, an article I can send to you. Um, but yeah, it's, um, Definitely more work needs to be done, but this okay. is a, this is a discourses that have been predominant in um, the West, you know, the okay. US, the UK, and West English speaking countries. Mm. Um, but I'll, I'll send you the the reference so you can dig Great. into that more. Thank you, thank you. Please do. Okay, so let so then let's go back to what's happening in the West now. Ninety percent mm -hmm. to be hitting at ninety percent accurate coverage is really great, but if you tease yeah. that out big differences on the political spectrum, isn't there? I mean, when I was looking at the UK, uh, you said Daily Mail, Mail on Sunday is statistically different. The Telegraph was also barely scraping by. I mean, they had about 70% coverage, if I remember correctly. I'm stupidly, I don't have yeah. the figures in front of me. Um, so yeah. it does very much seem to be sort of a politically split problem. Can you can you speak to that on in the, the other four countries as well that you studied? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, and it's interesting because we're, uh, our paper is not the first to um, uh, be finding this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we're building off of pre-existing literature that has found the same types of issues in terms of this polarization, uh, politicization of the issue. Um, so these, um, yeah, countries with, a, you know, who are owned by Rupert Murdoch, yeah, it is strongly correlated with, you know, how much they talk about climate change, um, how they talk about it mm -hmm. uh, versus, uh, you know, outlets that have a, a, a liberal slant, right, um, um, or different types of funding sources. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, no, it definitely does. Can you also speak to um, how often... Um, climate change is discussed in these different papers on the different sides of the the aisle um because it's quite interesting to understand isn't it that if we're if we're looking at a, a paper like the guardian it has 97 percent accuracy and it's also publishing a lot of environmental and climate yeah. journalism versus yeah. you know the telegraph i mean half of their climate stuff is columns sort of saying hey it's not that bad <laughs> yeah exactly yeah mm -hmm. exactly i mean and you can even see it. I need to pull up some of the figures. Um, but I mean, yeah, you're making a, a fantastic point about the number of articles uh, that are being produced. Um, and they're significantly more, uh, uh, and we had to account for this in our analysis, is significantly more accurate versus these conservative outlets just publishing a lot less. Mm -hmm. um, and then what they were publishing was less accurate. But they have gotten significantly better. Um, over time, so even even in the like the worst offenders, they have improved dramatically over time. So um, on the whole, you can sort of you can retire these these statements. You know that the media, the print media at least in these countries, is not accurately representing um, okay climate change because um, 
yeah, there's still problems for sure. But mm-hmm. on the whole, it's dramatically improved from uh, how it was, you know, in 2002. Um, yeah. But wasn't there an interesting thing in the original Boykoff and Boykoff study, the 2004, in which they saw that um, accuracy on reporting on climate change in the United States was actually pretty high in the 90s, wasn't it? And then suddenly it dropped off. Right. Yeah. Right. Could you speak to that? <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah, I have to pull up that article because I was, that was, that was Max Boykoff. That was his mm. work. So, um, so I have to re, honestly, I have to reread that uh, section. Um, but it, it, it doesn't, um, yeah, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, a lot of people, uh, you know, um, I mean, if this is later in the timeline, but they say, what if it had been someone else besides Al Gore, you know, yeah. coming out with an inconvenient truth? What it would have, would have been the impact of that because of his, you know, um, politics? What impact did that have on, you know, climate change discussion, you know, and would we have had made more progress if he hadn't been this sort of polarizing personality oh, representing this issue? Um, so oh, there's been some work on that. Um but about who this trusted person is, leadership, because, you know, most people don't read peer-reviewed literature on the weekend, you know, over breakfast, you know, nor could they because, one, there's there's uh, difficulty accessing this peer-reviewed stuff. A lot of yeah. it, you know, there's gates, it's, there's money involved, you have to pay yeah. for it. Yeah. Um, also, the language, you know, is sometimes impossible unless you have specific training and years of education in this field and how they talk about things. Um, There's that type of barrier, um, which is, you know, not just. And then, um, you know, that's part of the problem. And then you have, so most people, you know, the media is acting as a bridge to their daily lives, uh, but they have so many other things shaping their attentions, their perceptions uh, uh, of what's going on, you know, speaking with family, seeing what's going on and what celebrities are talking about these are more of their contact points and among all the other competing issues that you know that are demanding their time and attention um so i think uh yeah the media plays a pivotal role in you know shaping what people know about climate change but yeah. also these tr- these leaders um and celebrities there's been some really interesting work on that the power that they have yeah. you know in um shaping uh, narratives. Um, yeah. And so definitely who is talking, who is getting the space to talk matters. Yeah. And the fact yeah. that it was Al Gore or, you know, former Democratic VP, uh, this very, you know, famous liberal, um, that he was the spokesperson, you know, that's first, you know, first, I'd, um, it's really interesting work called The Honest Broker by Roger Peel. He also had a CU Boulder. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, the, people ask, you know, what if it had been someone else, you know, a non-political figure? Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, maybe it made such a splash because of who he was. We don't know. You never yeah. know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but people obviously love to discuss it endlessly <laughs> after the fact. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and you know, I mean, the, the right wing are very good of, of making a partisan issue out of almost anything. So if, they, oh. if there had been a moment of wiggle room to kind of make it a politicized issue, yeah. it would have happened Absolutely. no matter who said it, probably. I mean, another thing we're seeing is um, there's great work uh, as that's been identified, like tactical framing by the media. Okay. I don't know if you've heard of this. It's um, This is really interesting. So this happened a lot with the... Uh, um, there's a great Vox piece of it, actually. Uh, it, this happened a lot with the Green New Deal in the United States. So very few people know what the Green New Deal is, what mm. what it means, what it's about. What um, There's very little understanding of the actual uh, policy itself and whether it's a good thing or how we could move forward with it. Because a lot of the media reporting has... Uh, made it political. Is this good for the Democrats? How will this affect the midterm elections? Is this bad for Republicans? Did they just hand the, uh, what does this mean for Pelosi, Speaker of the House Pelosi? Um, mm. Making it all about the politics uh, surrounding this issue rather than the issue itself. Right. And, you know, this can make people, this this researcher, I'm um, forgetting her name at the moment, uh, but I can, again, follow up with that. Uh, it's also, it's making people more cynical uh, over time and, um, you know, less receptive to this. So it's really, um, 
this type of tactical framing is really, but it's, it's splashy. It's getting headlines. It's, um, yeah, it's firing people up, um, yeah. <laughs> along the political spectrum and, uh, getting those, that, you know, advertisement revenue, um, rather than actually focusing on the issue itself and how we move forward as, you know, demo- uh, as um, <laughs> citizens in a participatory democracy, right? So, um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In the 30 seconds, you just touched on, like, so many major problems. I mean, like, the, the for- for-profit maximization is, like, the engine of media. How is that ever going to work? <laughs> how is that ever going to work yeah. when you're in an emergency and when for-profit maximization is the cause of the climate crisis? Um, and interesting yeah. what you say about cynicism. There was actually um, a like uh, a sociological study done on um, how people perceive one another, and they found that um, cynics are perceived as more intelligent by their peers, <laughs> even if they're completely incorrect. So the idea <laughs> of being cynical of an I, of being cynical towards new information, people then perceive you as having some kind of critical capacity to judge uh-huh. that information rather than just being a cynic or not knowing or it being sort of ideologically against what you stand for and like emotionally responding yeah. to it essentially. So it's really interesting you saying that it's driving cynicism because that also creates a feedback loop of then people Absolutely. thinking that they are intelligent enough to reject these sort of like new important things that we need. To, oh God, it's such a mess. <laughs> But but I'm sure you and you're a part of and know about like yeah this new wave which is so exciting in the media like solutions journalism mm. um, and you know addressing this hope gap of like we're just endlessly bombarded with this depressing yeah. news every day yeah. and it's impossible and yeah. uh, demotivating and how can journalists you know um, still keep up with important rigorous reporting identifying the problem but then also use a lot of the piece to talk about how people are addressing it and what are the drawbacks of that limitations? How are we moving forward on this? What are sort of, so you're not just focusing exclusively on the problem, but how we're addressing it. And they go into a lot of Hans Rosling's work about how people misperceive like how bad things are. Like things are often much better than we think, but like you said, Mm. the cynicism creeps in and, uh, and people think it's much worse than it is. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's really the shift in, in journalism to to really uh, be more accurate, <laughs> you know, about what's really going on and how people are, you know, working all around the world, working on these issues, not just reporting the problem, but making the connections, you know, like you still see articles where they talk about, I don't know, like, Right now, there's this toxic red flare in Florida, uh, dead fish, dolphins on the beach, this horrible smell. People are coughing. There's human health, health impacts. They're canceling events. Um, and they're talking about, you know, the, how this is increasing due to, you know, increased nitrogen. It's like, instead of just talking about treating the symptoms when people are sick, like avoiding the beach, you know, is, you know how can we move from that to also beginning to say, well, okay, then what's the actual problem? Let's yeah. not just talk about treating the symptoms, but let's, let's start having, you know, what are connections we can make to how we can address this problem at, at a structural level or what the public needs to know about this problem. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. But Definitely. there is this shift, um, which is very exciting to see um, through solutions journalism approaches. <laughs> there was there was that study that came out though a few months ago. Um, I can pull it up if I managed to not quote it correctly. But it <laughs> showed that like people actually have a worse emotional response to solutions journalism. Did you see oh, really? it? <laughs> yeah, hang on. Do you know what? Let oh, me get there, it there was an there was an interesting piece uh, recently. Um, the same people uh, who work on The Lancet, um, uh, and they, they're talking about different frames and the media and how uh, positive framing for the most countries, uh, people responded positively to that, except in Germany, if I remember. They're like, no, be, a, be authentic, tell the truth straight. <laughs> tell the truth. Know, <laughs> tell the hard facts <laughs> and like, how we're addressing this. They wanted sort of that realism. Um, right. And so they were less responsive to that positive framing. This was a great piece. Um, the, the, this uh, one, the one that I'm thinking of. But maybe this is different from what yeah, you're thinking of. Yeah. Tear and Lynn, solution stories inspired more negative emotions than uh, climate problem stories. But 
right. they still encouraged but, hang on uh yeah it, they did not it, it did not induce hope in the participants of the survey reading solutions journalism i'm on i'm on the author's thread it was Catherine Tier. So the study showed that increased hope and eco anxiety increased support for collective climate action. However, solutions journalism did not spark those partic- uh, emotions in the participants. Interesting. Yeah, I'll to, send this. I'll to send this on that. to yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What yeah. what one do you have? <laughs> uh, yeah, my- <laughs> uh, this is fun. Um, this was in Nature. This was October two thousand twenty two from Nahir Sandi. Um, uh, Hillary Graham, David Hudson, um, and colleagues. Um, this was in Communications, Earth, and Environment. This was what I was referencing. Um, you know, public support for climate policy, this is our abstract, is important for the efficacy, yet little is known about how different framings of climate change affect public support for climate policies around the world. So this, they looked, they had an experiment they went with over 7,000 adults in five countries, China, Germany, India, UK, and US. Um, so they identify climate messages that elicit greater support for policies that tackle climate change. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. So then they, they randomly vary different attributes like a positive framing about you no know, more uh, looking at the opportunities or negative threat framings or if there's a specific theme like if it was connected to health um, or scale. Um, and they found that a positive frame, health and environmental frames um, and global and immediacy frames bolster public support. Uh, yeah, so that was really interesting. But there was variation amongst the, the countries, which is what I was uh, speaking mm. to about which frames resonated more with different countries. But overall, this is more evidence, which is, I, which is great looking at how, you know, the, the power of the positive frame mm. um, and bolstering public support for, for climate change. And obviously yeah. health. The connections between climate change and health is uh, really underreported. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that also has, a, that's a work out of the Lancet. That's so... Okay. Um, that uh, I can send that as well. Here's something. This is like quite a meta question, so I apologize in advance. But <laughs> the thing, the thing with sort of studies, right? Academic studies is you you need to collect data. Lots of problems. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but like you're collecting yeah. data of what exists, and you're looking at that, and you're analyzing, and you're like producing, um, you know, f- uh, finding conclusions, producing a report. But given like the urgency of the crisis and the amount of like experimentation really that needs to be done in terms of like how we're telling our stories, what the media is doing and the deep unlikelihood that the industries in the world are going to produce that kind of innovation that would allow academics then to do these um, retroactive studies essentially of what works best. How can academia as an industry respond by studying what best thing might be helpful that might not yet exist do you know what i mean Hmm, i think so could you elaborate like a bit further on that Mm. might not maybe a potential example um okay so for example like we're studying now solutions journalism because solutions journalism was sort of created in like in the 80s and you know we have have there's there's data now on it even if it's it's not it's not exactly mainstream but it does exist in mainstream outlets um but what if there's like another form of storytelling that we need to really navigate the climate crisis and change the narrative that might not quite exist Mm -hmm. yet and it is unlikely that these sort of big industry papers and outlets are going to be innovating in that way to achieve to to figure out what that mechanism is and so so this is the thing yeah Yeah. do you yeah do you yeah 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 that's a great great question (laughs) just opinion here (laughs) yeah go for it Um, I think the power uh, I'm a a big role uh, there's a big role for obviously I'm biased I'm a social scientist (laughs) so putting that out there but the the power of qualitative research and talking to people talking Mm -hmm. to communities exactly what the media does getting out there and seeing what people are doing right now how they're telling their stories how they're living their lives um through interviews through you know different surveys connecting with people so gathering that type of data and information that's more you know nuanced rich in depth um to sort of just see what people are doing right now on the ground um continuing 
to to do that, you know, talking with friends, community members, because there's so many different ways of experiencing climate change that, as you exactly say, that go well beyond the science of climate change. There's aesthetic ways, you know, there's emotional ways of experiencing it, uh, you know, as, as a community, um, not just the science of climate change, there's many ways to experiencing it. So I think you know, talking, just keep talking <laughs> to people, talking about it, keeping it as a prominent discourse, you know, uh, and looking at how people are dealing with it all around the world. I think that continuing that type of work, all, all we have to continue it. <laughs> throw the whole kitchen sink at this, obviously. Um, or no throwing. <laughs> like, you know, working and all the bad and up. But, you know, all approaches have to be pursued. But I think there's a, a, a pivotal role for for that continued work, which the media is doing, uh, but also a lot of people in academia are doing. So continuing mm-hmm. to fund social scientists, um, you know, because there's uh, resources for social scientists to continue that work, because I think that's where we're going to learn, you know, about these, these future ways of addressing it, um, because people are so... Ingenious communities are so incredible. So many of the powerful solutions and ways of addressing this have been bottom up. So, you know, providing more resources to let academics, media, any individual, you know, to keep talking about this, pursuing this and um, in ways that are illustrative through um, through qualitative data, not just the numbers. Yeah. Okay. Which are also important. (laughs) So, okay, so then I wonder, is there any work being done on looking at local media and their coverage? Because typically it will be local media who are speaking to these communities far more than national outlets. It's a great point. Yeah, and I'm um, sure there is. (laughs) I'm just not up to date on it. (laughs) I think that it's really tough right now in the media landscape. You're seeing a lot of these elite places like the New York Times or the Post, they're doing very well uh, but you know you're seeing a lot of these places in rural communities or these local papers going out of business really suffering yeah Um, so I think that that's a big that's a big problem um, yeah for exactly the type of approaches that I think are so important for um, obviously the times and the post they do phenomenal coverage of these issues but like you said in these um, smaller communities uh, local papers play essential roles for the community. So, yeah, uh, mm. it's a great point. Yeah. And I, I have to yeah. say, I, I mean, I would argue that there are so many sort of industry, even liberal leaning papers that are not doing a good enough job now. Like, yeah, some, sometimes yeah. I like rewrite headlines for fun. You know, when I like I one yes. recently was a it was a yeah. Guardian headline and it was like drive for a uh, demand for college and driving um deforestation amazon deforestation and i was like this is this is an incorrect headline because it is like such a tiny part of the problem it completely decontextualizes it's like demand for economic growth driving you know planetary destruction all around the world like that is the headline that is where all the branches come together and to keep treating each story almost as if as one little part of the problem and kind of refusing to like highlight the problem because how do you highlight the problem when you are a in a for-profit industry and it is very much like growth and demand of for-profit industries that is making up this economic super, super economic super organism that is cannibalizing the planet you know yeah absolutely what do you do it's it's a, it's the essential side it's the key point i um i think and it's all like you said it's like the novelty, the clickbait Mm. focused around extreme weather events and getting these peaks in attention around these conferences. You get peaks in media attention. You can see through the work of MECO uh, how the coverage changes over time. Um, This really coincides with a lot of these, you know, big events. Um, But, you know, how do you... Yeah, it's a a great question. I I think... um, yeah, these problems are so complex and overlapping and, uh, you know, being able to portray that given, you know, <laughs> how we consume media is all ever faster, right? With, yeah. you know, you have, yeah. now they're putting like, how many minutes to read this article? Oh, yeah. I can't spend more than seven minutes on yeah. the article. Yeah, 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 like, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, and then to, to spell out the complexities of these issues in so little space, yeah. given the attention span, 
uh, is is a real a real challenge for any journalist. Um, but I think you're right. You know, you know, picking out these things that decontextualize the issue. There are many things you can do, exactly like you said. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's yeah, it can be overwhelming. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I think it's. Uh... I'm just sort of waiting to see when the, the when the tipping point will be because I mean, everyone I speak to um, on this show is like it's, it's the economy. The economy is driving the climate crisis. It's how we've organized ourselves. It's exploitation, extractivism, and all this yeah. kind of stuff. And it's just yeah. like as as people become more aware and as the media sort of does begin to report uh, increasingly accurately, certainly on the science of the climate of the climate crisis, it's like I just wonder when they're going to catch up to the social science bit. And then when that, well, because e- economics is social science, <laughs> and yeah. what, what it will be our reckoning in a sense, because it really is, it will be the first instance of um, an industry being like, right, well, I suppose it's our duty to tell the truth and we are part of the yeah. problem. And how, so how, where do we find our role yeah. in that? And I think it's a really exciting moment of potential innovation. And I like would love it to be hastened in yeah. some sense. Yeah. I am um, also because of the dangers to the planet. Um, But until that moment, I'm, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, and you're, you're, you're so right. I mean, and also how media is just one part of this bigger problem. I mean, Mm -hmm. you still see Mm -hmm. this, uh, Mm -hmm. this is another, this work, you know, the individualization of responsibility. So how this common narrative that individuals and primarily through our, our consumption decisions and our buying habits and our, our role as consumers, how we can fix these environmental issues, if we just recycle yeah. that plastic bottle. Yeah. I mean, these dominant narratives yeah. that are so problematic and misleading about the role and the power of the individual yeah. um, that have been crafted in many ways by industry, you know, yeah. of pushing the responsibility on somebody yeah. else that's not them and redirecting attention to the yeah. individual, you know, who in no way can match the scale of the problem or, you yeah. know, I mean, it, it's really, it's really difficult you know um to how you you work on that as a community response you know as as acting as a as his words you know as a as a citizen like learning those skills and not first thinking of yourself as consumer because as you say Mm -hmm. that's the that's the structure we live within that's how we Mm. people understand things this is the easiest way oh if i can just buy better you know yeah it's not like a lot of people want to do the right thing (laughs) <laughs> like a yeah. lot of people care and they they're you know and um but it's um so difficult structurally given all these barriers and discourses yeah. um to 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 be able to to do that but then when you talk to people about you know the life they want to live and what they dream of for a future it's all very similar people yeah. want to live and beautiful cities with green spaces and public parts and great yeah. public transportation and yeah. uh, like the visions of that future are shared, you know, and it's crazy. Everyone has this, you know, this goal. Everyone wants clean air and water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everyone yeah. has this shared goal. And yet it's so difficult, uh, you know, to collectively, you know, organize around that because as you said, all these other existing structures um that we've set our our lives up to operate in um yeah so yeah they exist yeah. and they sort of <laughs> exist and also in order to like um decrease our imaginative cap- uh, capabilities as well absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah, yeah you, you see and then that's like these discourses of delay by identify and this happens with not just climate change but a variety of social issues like gun violence once you normalize it or you know say that this is impossible to fix it but can become that way you know you you like people you know accept it when these are absolutely yeah. unacceptable and and so you need to move beyond that and have these other discourses that you know don't allow for it to be normalized uh yeah. don't allow for, you know and 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 focus on um ways forward you know uh i think that that focus on the you know the solutions how we can Mm -hmm. move forward Mm -hmm. and address Mm -hmm. it in real ways um Mm -hmm. you're absolutely right i think about yeah we need to expand our imaginations our vocabs (laughs) our vocabs yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. power there's so much power in these discourses and who's allowed to speak and who gets you know even in these papers like 
yeah, what solutions are being talked about? Who's talking about them? Still so many mm-hmm. issues. Like, mm-hmm. And you know, are they at the front of the paper? You know, like, are they at the back of the paper? Uh, you know, all these other issues play into it um, that are so important um, as well. Yeah. <laughs> I completely agree with everything you're saying. <laughs> Yeah, lot, <laughs> lots still to be done, but thank you very much yeah. for all of your work on like drawing attention really, really to like what where industry need uh, needs to, where media needs to go. And I'm really glad to hear that a couple of papers reached out, one with good intentions <laughs> 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 to understand how they can do better. Good on the Guardian. Good for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was great. <laughs> thank you so much for your time and invitation. It was really fun talking to you. And on behalf of all my co-authors and colleagues uh, we appreciate your interest in our work <laughs> oh gosh Lucy, thank you so much it was such a uh, yeah. treat speaking with you such a pleasure okay. and to, to learn all of this really great thank you so much okay. my final question for you is who would you like to platform all oh, right this, i had thought a lot about this <laughs> um i have i guess one name um that keeps going my Giza ludica um she's in um, munich at the rachel carson um center institute i always mix them okay up. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's um out of lmu um uh, big university there and she's doing some really i think innovative interdisciplinary work around environmental education and um creative communication of of this work uh with the general public through um, various work with students and um, art installations and just different ways of communicating these issues um, that's really, really cool and cutting edge. I feel like oh, we're yeah. going on there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I want to speak to her. That'd be so, amazing. Yeah, yeah. And great. She's, yeah, she's great. Yeah, she's, yeah, and she's got a PhD. And, uh, uh, dissertation was all about education and, uh, you know, climate change, really cool stuff. So she would be a great person to talk to. Awesome. Lucy, thank you yeah. so much. <laughs> Uh, thank you. <laughs> if you'd like to read any one of the studies mentioned in the episode, I've put links in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to this channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it. If you loved it, support Planet Critical on Patreon, where you can also read my weekly essays inspired by each podcast interview. The Patreon link is in the description box below. As always, thank you to the Planet Critical community who support the show and make all of this work possible. Thank you all for listening. I'll see you next week.